Welcome to another video from Clifton Cameras. Today we will be hearing from professional sports photographer Jeff Carter. He's a Fujifilm X-Series pro shooter and he's got all the hints and tips on how to get the best from your sports photography and your Fujifilm X-Series gear. As usual, if you have any questions, queries or comments, then feel free to leave them in the description below or head on over to our website where you can contact us via email or use our live chat and we're even on the phones. So without further ado, I hand you over to Jeff Carter. Hello everyone. Thank you to everyone at Clifton Cameras for the opportunity for me to talk to you about shooting sports photography, uh, especially with the Fujifilm X series. First of all, a quick introduction to myself. Um, my name is Jeff Carter. I've been shooting motorsport for 25 years. Um, I left the Air Force in 1996. I was an engineer in the Royal Air Force um, and I worked for several newspapers, freelance for several uh, magazines as well. Um, I started acting as a press officer for the Mini 7 Racing Club, which is the um, oldest, uh, longest running single make race series in, in the UK. In 2000, I got my first break uh, in, I got to be the press officer of the European Formula Palmer Audi series, which I was asked to do the photographs as well, double, double job. Uh, 2001, I worked for the European Le Mans series and also got a job at Rockingham Motor Speedway as the press, of, press and PR manager there. Uh, 2006, British Formula 3, British GT, and then in 2009 I got my break with the FIA, the World Governing Body of Motorsport, who I still work for today, uh, working on the FIA GT3 European Championship. In 2010, I moved to the GT1 World Championship for the FIA and also worked at Le Mans, my very first Le Mans, with Nigel Mansell as his press officer for the Beach Team Mansell Motorsport team. Um, 2012, I moved to the FIA World Endurance Championship, which includes the 24 hours along Le Mans, uh, which I still work on today. In 2013, I added the European Le Mans series and the Michelin Le Mans Cup in 2016. And 2019, I'm now working on the FIA European Historic Sporting, Champ Sporting Rally Championship uh, and the Historic Formula European Cup, Historic Formula 3 European Cup. Um, so all in all, I've got a rounded um, sort of portfolio of championships that I work on that I shoot stills and video for um, so it's something I really love doing. This part I want to look at some of the genres I look I, I talk about some of the genres um, I work on I've covered motorsport but my speciality is sports cars and rallying um, I've this is a Rouge, you can see on the screen here. This is one of my favorite corners. Uh, it's Spa-Francorchamps in Belgium. Um, sports cars, uh, there's GTs, which are these are GTs, and I also work with, um, with Le Mans prototypes. And then we have rallying, historic rallying, uh, superb cars from the 80s and 70s, 80s and 90s in the European Historic Sporting Rally Championship. Autographs, which is grassroots motor racing and motorbikes. Um, I don't do so much motorbikes these days. I have done the British Grand Prix a few times, um, but this is a genre of two wheels. I love, if I get the chance to shoot two wheels, I will shoot two wheels. It's great fun and it's great racing. One of my top tips for any genre of photography is to know your subject. And that applies to every genre of photography, but especially sport. If you know how the game is played, you know how the sport is run, you can read the action. If you can read the action, you can anticipate what could happen next and you'll be ready to capture it. If you don't know the sport, then you're, you're shooting with one hand tied behind your back effectively. So if you can uh, learn the sport before you shoot it, you're gonna be at an advantage. So next up is, a, first of all, is event planning. Planning is key to any sort of sport or any sort of genre of photography, but sport especially. What I do is I, when I'm going to a venue, am I going to a new venue or an old venue? If, it's, if I've been there before, I know what I'm doing, but I still look at what happened the previous year and see if I can improve on something or find a new location. It's very difficult at race circuits to find new locations. If it's a rally, definitely. I always go in a day early and do a um, drive around the stages because it's really important. I know where I can get to especially, but circuits are a lot easier. If it's a new venue, then I do a lot of research online, look at other photographers, see what they've been doing there, um, and also um, you know check out uh, TPS, see where the sun's coming from, things like that you know getting some as much information as possible before I actually go to the venue 
traveling. Now, obviously this sounds very glamorous. I love traveling. I travel the world with, with the World Endurance Championship. However, I do a lot of flying. And when you fly, you have to get camera gear on planes. Now, um, some carriers limit the size of your car cabin baggage, which can be a problem. Um, I don't want any of my gear going in the in the uh, holds as in camera gear. I put things like tripods and uh, lights, if I take lights, I put them in, the, uh, in my hold luggage but things like cameras and lenses no I don't put them in the luggage I have a Manfrotto bag 50 litre bag which I know I can get two two X-T4 bodies in six lenses including the 200 f2 um, and it all goes in the it goes in the top locker on the plane um, it doesn't need to, it will fit um, any airlines uh, size requirements it's really important but i do tend to fly with bigger airlines like british airways or air france so i don't tend to have a problem anyway um, when i get to the track i always go for a walk uh, they do have a track walk with the drivers which is an opportunity to shoot the drivers and talk to the drivers at the same time but i'm looking for angles if there are any new red zones which are no shoot zones you need to be aware of where they are um, so it's getting a, a lie of the land also curbs you can see where the where the cars are going to jump the curbs or anything like that you can choose your locations by doing the track walk all about planning also keep your shoot list flexible you've got to have a shoot list but you have to try and keep things flexible um, you're always prepared for the for the unexpected um, especially weather um, keep an eye on the weather forecast uh, in the um, WC we have we have forecasters on site. If it's going to heavy rain, you need to be prepared. I've shot in heavy rain, snow, and even dust in the desert in Bahrain. So you need to make sure you've got the covers for your cameras and also the covers for yourself. You don't want to get wet because if you're wet, you're cold. You're not going to be at one. Of, you're not going to be shooting at your best. So you need to be prepared for the weather as well. Access now. One of the things I get asked a lot is about media passes and do we need one? With motorsport, as a spectator, you can go and shoot at any, lo any, any venue. However, certain venues like Silverstone can be a pain if you're a spectator because there are high fences. There are other area, other venues like Snetterton and Mallory Park in the UK who have low fences and you can get almost as good a shot as the professionals the other side of the fence because the fences are low. Um, so choose your, if you want to shoot motorsport and don't have a media pass, choose your location or your venue carefully and try to go for the smaller um, sort of venues. If you want to get tracks over the media pass, you, know, you need to know what to do. You need a letter of accreditation from a recognised publication. It could, be a, um, it could be a local newspaper or car magazine, anything that's got a story. Websites are okay if they're recognised as a, as a good site to have and lots of readers. A Facebook or Instagram page is not really going to cut it unless you're a big influencer with a few million followers. Um, so th if you can get a, uh, a letter of accreditation from an editor or a director of a publication, you've got your first step. Second step, you need to be have insurance. Um, all venues now require £5 million public liability insurance. So if you have no PLI, you do not get a pass, as simple as that. Um, it's not expensive, you know, £60, £70 pounds will get you £5 million. Um, so it comes with a package um, with some insurances, but, you know, make sure you've got it um, and got a, a letter to say you've got it. Even with, if you get accredited, you have to stay safe. Um, once you have your pass and your track side and you've got your photo vest, you need to stay safe. Motorsport is dangerous, it says so on the tickets. In the World, of Endurance, World Endurance Championship in the European Le Mans series, every photographer and TV crew must attend a safety briefing. If they don't attend a safety briefing, they don't get a photo vest. Red zones, as I said earlier, are no shoot zones, so be careful. You need to know where the red zones are and you must keep your eyes and ears open at all times so you don't shoot from the red zones. Even if it's not a red zone, you still have to be careful. It's not you know, for the faint-hearted. If you're attending a spectator, choose a circuit with better access. As I said earlier, Snetterton, Mallory, uh, Brands Hatch is even quite good in some places. If you go to high-profile meetings like British Touring Cars or British GT, your access will be limited. If you go to a club meeting with a few hundred spectators, you're going to have a lot more um, access and you can build up a great portfolio using these smaller meetings and then build up to the bigger ones. It's like in football, you don't go and shoot, you don't go and play at Wembley on your first football match. You start at the bottom and you work your way up. It's the same with photography and motorsport. You start at the bottom, shoot the smaller venues, shoot the smaller clubs, get a, get a reputation, build your portfolio and then work your way up. 
Techniques, right, freezing the action. This is what a good shot, uh, I took it Bahrain. This is about freezing action. So it's easy to put your long lens on your camera, shoot and shoot at 2,000th a second, you know, freeze the action and blast away at 10, 10 12 frames a second. You get sharp images, but sometimes they can look boring. You have to think about what you're doing. Um, especially if you're shooting the same corner again and again and again and again, your portfolio can start to look a bit samey. This shot was taken in Bahrain. Um, as you can see, I've cropped it slightly uh, a bit weird to the car to the top right of the frame. Um, on the angle as well, the, the, the corner there is banked, but you can see the back of the car is lifting slightly. So. I prefer to shoot lower shutter speeds, about 500 the second rather than 2000. It depends how fast the car is going through a corner. However, at 500, if you do catch sight of a wheel, it will be turning slightly, so it will give that sense of speed, which we'll go on to in a minute. If you shoot from the side at 2000 a second, it's going to look like it's parked on a track. It's like a parked car on a track. You know, um, I try to say to people, don't shoot cars where you can see the wheels at more than 500 of the second because you will get frozen wheels. It's like propeller aircraft. If you shoot air shows um, and you get propeller aircraft, you don't want the props frozen. It looks like the, the plane's gonna fall out of the sky, same with helicopters. You want to have those props moving, so 250th, 125th of a second to get the props moving. Same with wheels. You've gotta use the wheels to get the thing. So you wanna show the speed. These cars are doing 150, 200 miles an hour in places. You wanna show that speed, so freezing the action from the side is a bit of a no-no. From the front, yes, it looks good, especially if you've got another car behind, it always looks good, but do not shoot from the side at anything more than 500 of a second. This is where we come on to panning. All right, this is a technique I use a lot, and a lot of photo photographers use to give a sense of speed, but it depends on the shutter speed and also the, where the cars are on track, if they're traveling really fast or going through a slower, slower corner. So, Panning is shooting a subject at low shutter speed. So my default is 1 25th of a second. This is what this shot here is, this, the Aston Martin in Bahrain under the floodlights. So you try to choose a part of the car when you're panning. It's a technique of going across the frame, following the car across the frame and shooting as you go through. So if you shoot at, um, try and, what you try and do is shoot part of the car. Now. I, my cars are easy because they've got big number panels, so I tend to focus on that number panel and follow that through as I, as I pan with the car. So I'm keeping the center portion of the frame, the autofocus frame, on the, sh on, the, on, on the number panel and follow the car through. So the slower the shutter speed, the more dramatic it is. However, the slower the shutter speed, the less hit rate you get because you, you're, you're getting lots of movement, so you have to compromise sometimes, but it's practice. It's really, really practice. I've been doing this 25 years and I still don't get it right all the time, um, which I'll go through in a minute. Right, so at Le Mans, two weeks ago, I shot a series of, shot, um, series of images to demonstrate different shutter speeds at one corner. So this shot was taken at the last corner at Le Mans. You can see the module sporty, which is a very famous part of the Le Mans circuit in the background, which you can see in that shot, that's 250th a second. So the background is slightly blurred. There is movement in the tires because I'm shooting 250 the second. The cars are going relatively medium speed there because they've done a, it's the second part of the chicane before they go onto the main, main straight. But they're trying to carry as much speed through that corner to get back onto the main straight, start finish straight, as you can see, going away from them. So this is 250th, there's a hint of blur, but it's thing. But at 250th second, my hit rate will be 95 to 100%. Um, I'll say 95, because I do get the odd miss, but it's pretty easy to get a, a reasonable shot at that sort of shutter speed. Next shot is 125th of a second. So I've gone down a, shot, down a stop, um, so I'm going a little bit faster. Again, you can see in this shot, the background is more blurred, still pretty identifiable as the module sportif. You can see in the tires of the car, there's more movement in them, but again, it's not complete, completely round. You can see the Michelin um, logos, or sort of actually that's their Goodyear logos on that car, um, but you can see the movement in the wheels. Next shot is a 60th a second. Now we're getting even more movement now. Um, 60th, 125th, I'm getting 80 to 90% hit rate. So as I say, 125th is my go-to 
baseline. I try to go slower than that, but if I need to get some shots in, 125th is my baseline. That's what I tend to go for. 60th, you drop down, you're, you're dropping your hit rate to about 70%. Um, if there's more movement in the car body as well, if the car's going away from you, you get more movement in the car. If it's parallel to you, you try and keep everything everything sharp of the, on the car as well. But if it's going away from you or coming towards you, part front or back of the car will be slightly blurred. It doesn't matter as long as something in the car is sharp. It's all about the sense of speed. The next shot is a 30th. Now you can see I've got the car pretty sharp here, but on the logos on the wheels, you can see it's a complete round. It's the Michelin logos on that car are completely blurred all the way around. It looks like a white wall on the, on the tire. So you can see how fast the car's going there. The module sportif in the background, you can see it's completely blurred now. Um, still identifiable, but it gives that real sense of speed. And that's a 30th of a second. 15th of a second, now we're getting blur in the car as well, because the car is going away from me. Uh, that, that LMP1 car is really starting to get blurred but the number one and the the number panel on the side the rebellion that's all sharp so that's what i'm looking for again the background you can see the module sportif is really starting to blur now you can't really identify it if you didn't know where that was the last shot is a 15th of a second again there's a lot of movement in that car but the background is almost um, stripes it's really gone uh, quite blurred but it really gives a sense of speed um, I quite like it when you can nail the 15th of the second shots but I'm talking probably one in 10 maybe one in 15 shots are going to be hit that get an acceptable shot at that that slower shutter speed I can go slower I have gone slow. I've gone down to a second um, in Bahrain. I was trying one second shots, which is really difficult to do, and I've never really nailed it to my thing. I've done half second shots. This one's a, a quarter second. This is Le Mans. Again, you can see the movement in the car. It's almost like a double exposure, um, but it gives that real effect uh, that I'm looking for, the speed of the car. And like I said, there are sharp bits. There's no flash in there. I don't use flash, so this is all ambient lighting. Um, so you can see the background has gone completely like a, a streaks of light. It's almost like warp speed at, um, at in Star Trek. You know, you always get that effect where you get this warp speed, which is what I'm you know what I'm trying to portray the speed in my in my images. So um, it's very difficult, even that thing. But you're you know one in twenty, one in thirty. I'm lucky if I get a shot like that. So you know you've got to think. So what I do is I start at one twenty fifth, give myself a, a you know. A baseline get the shots in the bag the whole point is when you're working you have to get certain shots in the bag so 125th I know I can get them in the bag and then I work my way down um, depending on the light what's the lights available whether I've got ND filters available to allow me to shoot slower shutter speeds because when it's really sunshine you're not going to get those slow shutter speeds unless you've got ND filters so then so I've got a couple of questions um, Matt has said I've tried photographing a few amateur racing events like banger racing just as a spectator i'm trying to work out the best settings for getting past safety fences safety fences but also capturing some interest in action so far i've struggled to focus or capture any motion blur any advice well matt as i said earlier it's a shutter speed you need to think but as a spectator when you've got fences in the way it's a real pain i know i've done it i've been there where you are you are now um, that's how i started um, and it, it, is a bane, it can be a bane of the life. You can use them to give an effect, you know, a, the, like this shot, you could have a fence in front to give a, a, a even more of a blur effect, but I'm lucky I shoot inside the fences. You are not so lucky. You have to shoot through the fences. Try and find a position where you can shoot over the fence if you possibly can, um, or go to a venue where there are low fences where you can shoot. Um, the panning technique, as I said, is outlined. If you're having problems with autofocusing because the fences are in the way and it's focused on the fence, so either switch to manual focus and focus on the cars, where the cars are going to be on the track, and then follow through and th so that they'll ignore the fence. Or if you've got a, um, an AF custom function, like on the X-Series, we have um, obstacle, ignore obstacles. It's set two i think it is on the on the af custom functions i use that a lot for rugby and other other things i don't tend to use it for motorsport because i'm inside the fence line but for you it could be a good setting and other cameras have that thing where they ignore i 
objects that are in between you and the subject. So you've got the camera, you the subject, there's something here like a fence or something and it's focusing on the fence, not a thing. So if you ignore, if you set the AF to ignore the objects, it'll hold the focus on the, on the subject rather than the click into the fence. So that's quite a good thing. Tammy, Tammy said, what is the best lens support for longer, longer, longer days? Now, um, I tend to use a monopod on long lenses if I'm gonna be out for a long time. Um, if I'm gonna be out for an hour or two, I tend to not shoot with a monopod. But if you're out for a long day or I'm at a rugby match where I need to be switching cameras quickly while sat down, a monopod can be quite useful. So that's what I tend to use. Choose a good one. As again, the better ones, uh, carbon fiber ones can be lightweight, but they're strong. Um, but choose the best one you can afford. Um, but I always recommend, I think a tripod is not that useful at, motor, at sporting events unless you're videoing. Um, if you're shooting, don't bother with a tripod. They just get in the way anyway. You don't want to be bothering with them, but a monopod is very useful. So, Next subject is shooting high and low, shooting high and low. When you, we shoot, we tend to shoot the same eye level um, as the cars or whatever we're shooting. And it can, again, it can look a bit same as you're trying to mix things up a bit. So try and get up high or try and get down low, which um, sometimes easier said than done, but there are some venues where you can stand on a banking higher up. And I will go into the spectator areas if I need to, to shoot a high shot of a, of a car. Um, I'm not adverse to going like at Le Mans, going into the trees and shooting in the spectator areas and then going back track side afterwards. Um, but I try to vary my angles. Now this is a shot I did at Sebring. This is a photographer's platform at the hotel corner, a very famous corner at Sebring in Florida. Um, you can see I've used a wide angled lens. This is a 10-24. So, um, you know, that I do use wide angled lenses to give some perspective and also to give some, you know, where we are in the world. So um, the other one is getting down low. Now this was taken in the pit lane at uh, Le Mans. You're not allowed to lay down. Um, for, I think it's pretty obvious why you're not allowed to lay down in the pit lane. It's dangerous and you can't get out of the way of the cars if they're coming coming into the box or going leaving the box, you can't get out of the way. So when I got my first XT camera, I got a flippy screen. Now everyone laughed at me saying, ooh, flippy screen, that's a bit amateurish. And actually, Everybody wants flippy screens now, especially when in motorsport, because you can get down low without getting down low. You can kneel down, you can you can put the camera low, and you can see what you're doing by putting the lens, putting the screen upright, so you can see like a waist level viewfinder. So you can see what you're shooting, and you can get this magnificent view down towards um, the cars. Uh, it's a different perspective. It's actually quite a nice one and something I use a lot. Um, the other place to go is grandstands. As long as you're not in the way of the spectators, if you're a spectator, fine, you're in your seat, you've, you can shoot what you like. As a member of the media, my, my rule is I do not get in the way of spectators. You've paid to be there, I haven't. So, But if I can get a shot from a grandstand, especially if I can get lots of backs of heads, um, it's quite a nice thing to do. Um, and quite a nice shot to have as well. So again, going back, um, shooting at night. Now that's a tricky one. Uh, at Le Mans, this is Le Castellet, but Le Mans a couple of weeks ago, shooting, we have a lot of night. It's tw near 12 hours of shooting a night for a 24 hour race. So you have flood lighting, you have um, sort of ambient light going on and it can, and also headlights can fool um, can fool autofocus systems. You know, there's a lot of light bouncing around. So you have to be careful. I always shoot in manual exposure, so I'm controlling the manual because if you're shooting in auto exposure with bright headlights, it's going to go, the exposure is going to go up and down like a yo yo. So I choose my exposure carefully. I shoot with shutter speed on the back dial, um, ISO on the front dial, and obviously on, on uh, X series, you've got the uh, aperture ring on the front. So everything is controllable, and I can see through the viewfinder what the exposure is because it's an EVF, not an optical viewfinder. So I tend to sort of, you know, use fast aperture lenses at night because of the fact that you're trying to get the ISO as low as possible. So F2s, I do shoot my 90 and my 200 at night. I'll shoot my 5140 F2.8. Um, so it, I would even shoot my 1.4s. You know, I've got 16 and 35 1.4s. So I will shoot those at night to, to allow me. And I even took the 51. 1-0, the new 50mm F1 to Le Mans to shoot in the pit lane because it was so bright with that lens, I could actually shoot a lot of higher, uh, much higher shutter uh, speed than I would do if I had a or lower ISO because of the fact that I had it. And of course with the X-T4, that 
is stabilized as well. So uh, next up, we've got uh, so we've got the shots, and then we've got shots like this, which are head on now. This can cause problems, as I said, with the autofocus. Now I was shooting at a slight angle on this shot, so the headlights weren't directly into my lens. I was shooting slightly down on the cars that were going on this corner, so I was doing, but it was causing problems. So I would manually focus on the corner, on the part of the um, on part of the track which i knew the cat the cars were going to come through so if it's causing a problem you twitch the manual focus um pre-focus on the track and wait for the cars to come through and just fire three or four frames as they go through that point and one of them or two of them will be sharp so you know um that's when you use a high shutter speed as high as you possibly can obviously at night you are limited but that was a 200 f2 so i was shooting at f2 so my my shutter speed was slightly was high enough i think it was 500 the second um, the iso was low enough that it didn't cause loads of grain but i'll shoot up to 6400 without even really worrying about it so also when you're at motor rider racing don't just shoot the cars think about the people around you you've got the fans you've got there's loads of portrait opportunities now motorsport is a bit of a weird one because you have to shoot at you know you're shooting uh, athletes are inside her helmet and also inside a car so you try to get into the pit lane you're not going to be able to do that but you will have autograph sessions you will be able to go in the paddock so it's worth going and try and find those people shots also things like mechanics working on cars that sort of thing so it can be another side of the story you're trying to sell the sell the story it's part of that story so and there's also fans the super fans as we call them. this is in japan you can see this guy's a bit of a toyota fan um quite a nice character shot you know that was taken when i was just walking around so you just grab them as you can so it's it's great so photo gear let's talk about photo gear um x series as, as i said before i'm a fujifilm x photographer i've been shooting with fujifilm since 2014 well 2013 i was a nikon uh, pro for 18 years i use nikon for all my stuff i bought an x pro one in 2013 well actually i bought an x100 in 2012 great camera i bought an x pro one with the four primes when it first came out and i thought yeah that is going to be it's going to be a great um, camera but I'm not going to switch yet. X-T1 came out in 2014 I thought I tell you what I, I love the, the look of the Fujifilm files I'm taking it everywhere it's lightweight okay the lenses weren't quite there yet but I thought I'm going to give this a go so I decided to switch sell my Nikon gear and switch to Fujifilm so I bought two X-T1s and all the lenses I could get my hands on. It was a challenge I'll be honest with you it was a challenge and I persevered with it. Luckily, I persevered with it. I was almost on the verge of giving up on it, but I persevered and I'm glad I did. Um, I'm not gonna tell you that the Fujifilm X-Series is the best camera for sport. Um, it can do the job. Now we've got cameras, I can do my job with it. I wouldn't be using it otherwise. You know, I have to buy my own gear. I don't get given gear. I have a nice discount as part as an ex-photographer, but I have to buy my own gear. I wouldn't be using it if I couldn't do my job with it. So let's be honest about it, you know. Um, but Canon, Nikon, Sony, they're all out there. They've all got their plus points, they've all got their minus points. Now the other three are obviously full frame, where crop frame, full frame has advantages. Crop frame has advantages that the, the, the shorter lenses can, uh, by the crop factor are multiplied by a 1.5 times factor. So we do get the advantage of a 200 mil F2 is really a 300 mil uh, field of view. So, and I've got a 1.4 converter that I stick on that lens. Um, the 100-400 is a 150-600, you know, on, a, on an X-series. So you've got a lot more pulling power with, with 100-400, you know. So, you know, we have advantages with the, with the thing, with the um, crop frame um, X-series. Um, I get asked a lot, is a, a Canon EOS 1DX Mark III, is it, a, is it faster or slower than an X-T4? Well, Plus the fact that the one one DX series is a five thousand six thousand um, pound pro camera, XT fours that they are a third of the price. You know, let's be honest about a quarter of the price. But an XT four can do the job. It is really really good. An XT three, even an XT thirty, it's a really good camera. You know, so from horses of course is yes the one um, DX can do things but i can do just as much with my camera than they can do with theirs you know and at the end of the day my clients only care what i produce if i can get the images they want they don't care what i use so it's really important now the 200 mil 
for me is the best sports lens. I love the 200 millimeter. I asked, I went into a meeting in Fujifilm in Tokyo in 2015 and asked, actually asked for that lens. It took us three years to get it, but the, the end product is superb. I love it. I, it's what I use mainly at a racetrack. Uh, track side the 1.4 converter i'll even stick a two times converter on it it's very very good the earlier shot of the porsche on the corner in bahrain that was taken with a two times converter on the 200 mil it's super sharp um, and the autofocus is really good on it as well the 1.4 you don't even know it's there apart from the fact that you're shooting at 2.8 rather than f2 um, optically and performance wise there's no difference between the with the with the 1.4 or without the 1.4 it's a match converter so a two, a two, a 300 millimeter is probably our minimum focal length. So the 200 mil, which is a 300 mil, that's a minimum. The standard lens for a, a motorsport photographer is 400 mil, 2.8. That's what most photographers use. With the 200 mil, with the 1.4, we have a 400, 2.8. 600 f4 is a luxury. We do use them, um, but we can. Now I use two X-T4s for my work. I did have X-T3s, but I sold them to purchase the T4s. Um, but there's nothing wrong with a T3. If you're shooting with a T3 and you shoot stills and you're thinking, oh, I really think I'm ought to buy a T4, think again, think carefully before you do it because for stills, the T3 is a really, really good camera. It's got the same sensor. There are certain advantages of the T4, the IBIS, you have the um, better batteries, um, and also, you know, it's 15 frames a second, which can be an advantage, but it's not a huge jump. So if you've got a T3, don't think you've got second best. However, I shoot video, a lot of video. So the T4s, for me, is a hybrid camera for me. I shoot videos and it's a brilliant video camera. It's a much better video camera than T3. So that's the reason I've got T T4s and I sold my T3s. It's That's the only real reason I did that. The other lenses I use, I have the 5140 2.8, which is a great lens. Um, it's a standard telephoto zoom from, for sport, any sport, and you can fit the converters to it as well. So you have that advantage of adding bid on. I also have the 1655 2.8, which is the only zoom lens is not stabilized. Obviously with the T4, I've now got IBIS, I can stabilize it. However, at 2.8, I don't need to, really need to worry too much about that, but it's nice to know that I can stabilize it now. I have the 1024 f4, which as you've seen earlier, I do a lot of shots with the wide angles to give a bit of perspective where we are in the world. Um, people have asked me why didn't I buy the 816. The 816 is a great lens. It's a 2.8, it's one stop faster. However, I shoot, also shoot landscapes and I, it's a pain in the backside that the um, 816 has this bulbous um, front element which means you've got to buy another set of filters um, so i've stuck with the with the 1024 it's a great lens um, great value for money i also have a set of primes i've got the 90 mm f2 the 35 1 4 18 f2 the 16 1 4 and i have a samyang 8 mil fisheye as well which is a great little lens bang for buck that's a great um, purchase because you get that wide element if you need it go inside the garage or inside a car get a really wide 180 degree um, field of view brilliant um, and it's not a lot of money it's manual focus but it doesn't matter anything beyond a meter is going to be in focus anyway so it's great I tend to favor the zooms because they're flexible in a fast moving environment but I have the um, z the primes in case I need to sort of you know the, sh uh, the faster shutter speeds or I can be a bit more arty um, I did use the 50mm one F1 at Le Mans a couple of weeks ago. Um, I love it. I love the, the thing. I won't be buying it because it's a bit short for me. I prefer to shoot with a 90mm or the 5140 to stand a little bit further back from the teams while they're working. Especially in the COVID-19 times, we have to stand, have the di social distancing. The 50mm is a bit short. I did have the 5612. I did sell it because I wasn't using it as much as I thought I would use it but they are brilliant lenses. If you're a portrait or wedding photographer, you need to get one of those. It's a stunning lens. So we'll take a couple more questions. And Simon asks, my camera only shoots six frames per second. Can I achieve, achieve sharp images or do I need a better camera? Well, Simon, frames per second don't really matter too much when you're talking about things. Yes, I shoot with 15 frames per second on my X-T4s, but I'm shooting very deliberately. I'm shooting two, three, four frame bursts. I'm not shooting what we call a pray and spray or spray and pray, you know, sort of keep your finger on the button and just hope you get one shot. It's very deliberate, but what it does allow me to do is get one or two shot, shots of a fast moving car 
um, or if something happens in front of me, I can fire 15, 20 frames over car crashing or whatever. So I've got that ability just to keep my finger on the shutter release and get those shots. What you need to concentrate on, I think, is getting the, if you're saying you're not getting sharp images, it's a shutter speed, like I said earlier about panning, making sure you choose the right shutter speed for the car you're shooting. Also, the continuous autofocus, make sure you're on continuous autofocus, not on AFS servo. So you're only, it's, Servo means it's only stopped on one part of the car, and then when the car's gone through, it's out of focus. You're not following the car with a with a auto, continuous autofocus. And if you have the ability, to shoot with um, ignore obstacles. If you've got a if you've got custom functions on your autofocus system, set it up so you can ignore objects like fences, etc. Um, but the shutter speed and the autofocus is really really important. If you can't autofocus properly. You know, you're having problems with the autofocus in pre-focus, like I did with the shot at Le Mans earlier, pre-focus on the track and then wait for the cars to come to you and then shoot the cars that go through the corner. Um, but you are limited then. If something else happens, you're in manual focus, you can't then switch quickly. So I prefer not to do that unless I'm deliberately trying to get those shots um, of that corner. And it's difficult with the autofocus because the lights or whatever are upsetting the autofocus. Steve has asked, asked me, would you have any preferred settings using an X-T3 and a 100-400 lens? Steve, first of all, that's a great setup. That's what I had. Um, I sold the 100-400 because I got the 200. So, but the 100-400 it is an, a, an absolutely stunner of a lens. I was lucky enough to be part of the test team for that, that lens. And when I first got it, I went, oh, 5.6, you know, it's, it's brilliant. It's a stunning lens, very flexible and bang for buck. It's a great, it's a, it's a, fairly, I know it's expensive, but it's a fairly cheap lens for what you get out of it, you know, and it will take converters as well. So the 1.4 will increase your range even further. My settings, um, I tend to shoot in manual, as I said, so I've got the shutter dial set to T and it's locked off. The shutter speed is then on the rear command dial. So you can up and down the shutter speed quite easily on the rear command dial. I have the front set the, on the top you have the ISO dial and I have that set to C and the front dial is set to um, ISO so I can change the ISO on the front dial, okay? Optical stabilization should be on, always leave it on, don't worry about switching it off, to be honest I'd never have a problem when you're panning with it, it's on, it did use the judder originally with the T2s but no more so you, you're not fighting the lens, it's the, the OIS system on these lenses, these Fujian lenses is, is really good. Autofocus, as I said, AFC with the uh, camera set to boost. So um, on the on the drive, you set it to boost because it'll improve the autofocus system a lot. It improves the action time. So set it to boost. Yes, you'll use your camera batteries will drain slightly faster, but don't worry too much about that. Just buy set extra batteries. Um, I have the AF custom settings set to three, accelerating or decelerating the subjects, or two, which is ignore obstacles. Choose whichever suits you best. Um, AF mode, single point. I tend to use single point for, for accuracy. If you're having problems, set to zone. So you have a 3-3 three, three zone and move it around the frame. Um, I never use the wide because um, it tends to focus on things that you don't want it to focus on. But if you use a zone, you can, on the front of the car, you can then think, but if you're feeling confident and you can get keep your autofocus point, use a single point. You can make it bigger or smaller, but medium size on the front of the car. Drive setting set to CH, either eight or 11 frames a second. I'd recommend if you've got, you know, put it on 11 frames a second um, and then choose your shutter speed accordingly. So if you want action freezing subjects, minimum thousandth a second, panning shots 1 25th or, or lower. It's up to you, um, but yeah. And adjust the ISO accordingly to get the shutter speeds you need because you're normally shooting wide open with 100, 400 on F5.6. Um, so shoot um, shutter speed and just adjust the ISO. The ISO can go to 6400 without any real problems on a on a, a T3, T4. All right, it's pretty good. And what, another tip is you can always, um, if it's a grainy image anyway, you can always adjust it in, in uh, Lightroom afterwards or post-production. You can always you know, put noise reduction on it. If you get a blurred image and you mean, you mean to get a sharp image, you can't save it you're better off getting a grainy image and getting a sharp image and then doing the re noise reduction in post, as long as it's not too much, do be careful with it. But it's better to have a grainy sharp image if you want a sharp image um, than a blurry image if you don't want a blurry image because you can't save it. 
All right, so. So let's talk about some other sports. You know, this is motor sport. Um, I, that's my genre, um, but I have shot other sports in my career. Um, I've got a question here from Jess. Do I need permission from anyone to shoot at my local sports club? Now, motor racing is slightly different because motor racing, you're expected to take cameras. The spectators are, are expected to take cameras. However, sports clubs, it depends. My recommendation is always to contact the club or the organizers of that event, just to check that you can take a club, especially if it's football or rugby, when you're going into a stadium environment, you don't know what their rules are, so it's best to check. So if you can check the rules, um, because if you turn up with a camera and they say, nope, sorry, you can't bring that in, it, you're gonna be turned away. So it's a bit of a disappointment. Also, if you talk to the organizers beforehand and explain what you're trying to do and what you're trying to achieve, you might even get better access because some of the local clubs actually love photographers turning up and they might ask you for a couple of free images. Don't be afraid to do that because you're helping them out. You'll get. You might even get them in a program or something like that. You know. Be, you know. Don't be afraid to give them free images in return for better access. I've done it with my local football club here. Given them some free images, and I've gone to training um, grounds and done stuff with them, and got some nice portraits and things like that. You know. You get better access if you if you're upfront about what you want to do. It's a great way to get started in photography, in sports photography. You start at the lower levels, start at the club levels. As I said earlier, you don't start shooting at Wembley. You, if you want to shoot football, you can't shoot at Wembley. It's not, it's impossible. But if you can start at the local clubs and work your way up, then you can get build up a portfolio and get much better access. So we're going to start with canoe slalom. Now, I was the canoe slalom, uh, British canoe slalom team's uh, official photographer in 1995-96. When I first started, I got a thing. It was a free um, deal I did with them. Again, getting my foot in the door. Um, they're a small organization. They have one high, pro you know, they have the high profile events, but to be honest, it was the Olympic, it, 1996 was the following year. I didn't get to go to the Olympics, which is a shame, um, to Los Angeles, but I did go to the three or four high profile um, championship events before the, the Olympics. So it's a great sport to shoot. It's um, unlike motorsport, you can see what the, the, the grit and determination of the athletes, the paddlers. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's really, really a great sport to shoot. And there's lots of water, it's very dynamic, um, very fast as well. So it's worth having a go at. So check out where your local thing on British Canoe Slalom uh, website, you can find out where your local events are. One of the best tips I can say is a shot like this. This is on a turn. Now it, you go through gates. Slalom is going through gates, but they have what they call down gates and up gates. If you can shoot on an up gate, they're going up against the flow of the water, so they're relatively slow. And as they go through the corner, they, they turn. As they turn to go downstream again, this is this shot here. So you get this fantastic image of somebody, of the paddler turning into the camera. So if you get your position right, you can sort that, you can get a really good image. So, and if you, again, if you're having troubles with autofocus, you can, you can focus on the poles. And as they turn around the pole, you can then get the shot because you're focused on the pole, manually focused on the pole, you can get a good shot as they turn around. in. But autofocus is really where it's at, but be careful with the water, which is what the next shot is showing. This is a, and you can see the amount of water that's going through. Now, this was taken with an X-T2. So this is not the more modern next series. This is an X-T2, but you can see it's kept the focus on the paddler, not on the water. This was taken with a 100-400 lens. Um, and I, I really love this. Again, it was a shot at, at 11 frames a second. I took three or four shots as they went, as the paddler went down through this rapids, and I managed to get this big spray as they came through, and it works. For me, it's a dynamic shot, you know, lots of water. It was backlit as well. Always check the lighting, where you're shooting from, because the more dramatic the lighting, you cannot use flashes, canoe slalom. Don't ever take a flash gun to canoe slalom because they will just throw you out because it's not allowed. So you cannot throw in your own light. So you have to use what's available. So this, again, is a nice sunny day. Um, the far bank was in shadow. The close, the, I was in the sun and the sun was slightly to the, to the right of the image. So behind and slightly to the right. So I'm getting this beautiful effect of the wa water being lit by sunlight. So, and also the good thing is, it's acting like a reflector, reflecting light back into the face of the paddler. So you don't haven't got the paddler in shadow. 
So again, be careful, but again, autofocuses can, autofocus can be fooled by things like that. So just be careful, all right? But if you've got the ignore obstacles um, function on your autofocus system, that's a good thing to set for this sort of thing because it will keep the lock on the paddler um, and ignore any splashes that are coming up through for about two seconds. So the good thing about auto, um, slalom, canoe slalom, is the, the access is very, very good. Um, you don't normally have to, um, is not, don't need a media pass for it, but contact the organisers beforehand. Explain what you're doing. Just try and um, explain. Again, they, here I was on the far bank. I'd signed, I'd actually signed on with them. Um, I was there as a spectator, but I went there and explained what I was trying to do. And I said, I would like to go on the far bank. So I had to sign on and I was allowed access where the officials were, which as a spectator, you wouldn't have normally been allowed to. So again, talk to the organizer, explain what you want to do. You might get better access. Next, uh, another one I shot, again, long lens shot through the poles. Um, you can see I shot that at f5.6 on, on a 400 end. So the poles are out of focus. So again, looking for a different shot. Water skiing, wakeboarding, another water sport that I love shooting. I've got a, here in Dunbar where I live, uh, we've got the Fox Lakes, which I, I do go down there and shoot the, the, the wakeboarders doing all the jumps and all the rest of it. And it can look quite dramatic. This was a water skiing event I did down in Lincolnshire at the Hazelwood um, Ski Centre near Lincoln. Um, again, access is very, very good. Um, again, explain to the organisers, don't just turn up. Um, explain what you're trying to do, just check, but you can get some dramatic shots. Again, backlit water can be produce a really, really nice effect. I, I did shoot it though, this is not a cropped image. I did this on purpose, trying to get the legs of the skier in as they turned. So I got the water spray as they went round. Very high shutter speed, I think that was 2,000 of a second, may even be higher, to make sure I froze the water. So, um, but you can see the effect as I got the, uh, the, the water coming, the water droplets coming off the bottom of the, of the board. Um, so yeah, um, I'm very proud of that image. Then you've got the dramatic shots. Again, this is a, I've zoomed out a little bit to get the uh, skier in the in the in the shot um, as on again on a turn. Tend to be the the turns tend to be the uh, thing where you get this wonderful spray of uh, thing. The good thing is this lake is very long and narrow, so you're on one bank or the other, so you know where they're going to turn, so you can get fairly close. You don't need to have 100, 400 to get a shot like that. That, that would, I could probably take that on a 50, 140. So a 200 mil would be, would frame, would fill the frame quite nicely. So you don't need long lenses for a sport like this for most shots. Not saying you don't need them for all shots, but most shots. And then you get the, let's say this was a trick event. So they were doing tricks, they were doing spins, they were doing jumps, they were doing all sorts of things. And again, I've got this shot. High, high shutter speed, you can see we, he's done a couple of uh, um, spins and I got him mid, again, I shot it 11 frames a second and I got four or five shots as he was going over, but this was the one that, that worked really well. And then we got eventing. This is a very different sport. Now I used to work for a newspaper in Lincolnshire. Um, so I used to cover the Belt and Horse Trials and the Burley Horse Trials. So two high profile events. So I, I did that every year for a few years for the paper. So again, I was on a media pass and I was able to get into good positions. But again, eventing is one of those, is one of those sports you can get fairly close without um, a media pass. You don't need to have a media pass. You just need to be careful of where the courses are. Now this is a, th a, th a one day event with dressage, show jumping and cross country. Cross country is normally where you get the best shots. Um, <laughs> it's, it does draw the photographers, but I love the show jumping arena as well. And again, I'd like getting down low because normally the background's quite busy. So you either shoot with a telephoto lens um, and then shoot with a wide aperture to show the, throw the background out, out, of, out of focus. So that's where my 200mm f2 comes in very handy because it throws the background out really nicely. Um, this was taken on a 1024. The fence was quite close to the rope at the side of the, the side of the arena. Never cross the rope. Always stay behind the rope. Um, and I shot 
low down as you can see so I'm shooting through the, almost through the grass so again it's getting that jump and as the rider came over the over the jump I was able to get the shot again three or four frames bum, 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 and then I got the as I went over the jump so that one worked really well this is a panning shot now you know I talked about earlier about panning with motor racing cars well, I do it with, with horses as well I do it with all sorts of sports it works really well but the difficulty is that unlike a car which is going horizontally and it doesn't tend to go up and down vertically a horse is doing this so again you've got the movement in the uh, horizontal and the vertical as you can see in this image so again it makes it doubly difficult to get a, a, a reasonable sharp sharp shot so this I was really pleased with this shot this was about a 60th of a second going through the water splash um, again you can see the rider is moving um, but it doesn't matter it gives that sense of speed gives a sense of movement which I quite like um, but it's a different thing so you can use panning techniques for other sports not just motorsport and then there's the ubiquitous head-on high shutter speed um, again I used an f2 lens on this this is a 90 mil f2 I used on this one rather than my 50 51 42 8 to throw that background out um, again you can get quite close to the jumps so it's uh, you know you know horses of course as they say literally um, just be careful when you're if you're an event a, a, a question event make sure you stay behind out off the course make sure you're not blocking the officials as well there are officials on each fence make sure it's even worth going talking to the officials between uh, stages and you know doing where the, where they where you can and can't stand though most people at these things if you talk to them they're quite happy to give you their advice or whatever so you stay out their way but also you might get better shots chris has asked how do i approach asking if i can shoot in a regional equestrian event now this event was for Gandeni in persia chris and i contacted the organizers beforehand because it was a closed event it wasn't you can go as a spectator but it's not you can buy, can't buy a ticket or anything like that um, so it's worth um, shooting plus the fact that most of these events have their own photographers and the photographers if they see a big lens and they've paid money to do the photographs for the for the event they can be a little bit funny so I've um, I went and spoke to the photographer and explained what I was doing uh, on thing but I got permission beforehand from the organizers to make sure they knew exactly what I was doing I was doing it for Fujifilm it was a it was a series of um, sporting of events I was doing for, for Fujifilm um, to demonstrate different lenses different um, cameras so um, I wasn't there to sell images to, um, to to the local competitors so I wasn't stepping on anybody's toes but it's worth contacting again again you might get better access so give them a give them a call find out who the organizing club is or the farmer or whoever's land it's on just check to see who is in charge if you go to the um, the British um, Equestrian uh, Society, or what I can't remember what the name, um, the governing body of Equestrian, um, sorry, British Eventing, sorry, that's the name, British Eventing. If you go to their website, you can find information out on the organisers. So if you go to the British Eventing website, you can find out more information. But if you can get the local um, organiser, do it because it's much better for you. Next up is power boats. Right, I did this. I've done power boats at Hon Pierpont in Nottingham when I was working for the paper. This was um, the P1 power boats in Greenock in Scotland. It was a, um, a European uh, series that the Scottish, the UK round was in, it was in Scotland, about 70 miles away from where I live. And the local boat was, this boat was based in Musselburgh, about 20 miles up the coast from me. So I got to know the the um the crew very well um did some test runs with them did a video with them and all the rest of it so i went along as media to this event now um you can go as a spectator um if it's an offshore event like this you're on the on the on the shore they do come in quite close so um, you can get some reasonable shots but this was taken from the back of a, of a boat of a media boat as you can see, I'm quite low. The weather was awful. Um, it was raining, it was blowing a gale, typically Scottish weather, I suppose. Um, but you can see how dramatic it was. So I was getting this thing, but the boat was bobbing up and down. So you're shooting, but you're doing this. And it's almost like you're getting 
sea, sea, boat, sky, 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 and it's really difficult to shoot from the back of a boat. Um, also, the boat's turning in the wind, so not only are you trying to keep it level, you're also turning with the boat, so you're trying to think move as well so it's it is ultra very very different it's not like shooting motorsport trackside where you're static shooting from a media boat is actually very difficult um but you get some really really nice shots like this i love this shot and i love the drama in it uh, and we were lucky it the rain had just gone through so the rain clouds behind and it was lit by a bit of sunshine the boat was lit by a bit of sunshine this is during the race as well so i was very lucky 100 400 lens as you can see great lens um anybody that's thinking about shooting sport with the fujifilm series for x series look at the 100 400 the 200 is a really nice lens i love it to bits but i am a professional and it's a lot of money if you can afford it buy it but the 100 400 bang for buck is fantastic um so next shot is now as i said it was very choppy this is from the shore um, so you can, any spectator could have, got, could have got this shot. Um, but you can see they're hitting the waves and they're lifting. So again, this is my Inverclyde boat, my Musselboro crew, um, got them thing. You've got the cranes, the Clyde, Clyde point, um, the cranes, the very famous cranes, um, in Glasgow along the, along the shoreline there on Greenock. So, and I managed to get that as a nice backdrop. I think that was a 5140, not even a hundred, 400. So, um, it just shows you how close I was, but you've got that lift as they're coming out. You've got to time it right because they're not going to do it, unlike r racing cars who are, if you hit a curb, they're going to bounce and you more or less know which cars are going to do it because it's waves and the waves are choppy. You don't know it's going to do that. So you've got to be ready for the, for the shot. Next shot is, this is after a boat had dropped in the water. So we've got this fantastic, and I've got four or five frames. I've got one shot of it where it was literally covered in spray. And then I've got this shot, which it came out of the spray to carry on going. And they're doing about 60 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour, these boats. So it's mo they're motoring quite well, but as you can see, it's come out of this spray. I wish I'd got a head on shot. It would have been even better head on. But again, this is from the shore. You can see that, you know, we've got that. And again, it's a far shutter speed. Power boating, you really want far shutter speeds. You can do pan shots, and I have done pan shots, but this is where you want the water and the spray and the action and the lifts it, to, to give you the, um, to give you the um, drama within the sport. So we're going to slow things down now. It's cricket. Now, if you're in the UK, you've invariably got a local cricket club. You can go and shoot. Um, again, talk to the club. Um, you can go along with a camera and as long as you don't stand in the eye line of the batsman or the bowler, don't stand in front of the screen, the uh, white screen, stand to the side slightly or shoot from anywhere around the boundary line, you're fine. Um, so, but again, talk to them, you know, talk to them. They'll, they'll, they'll most likely welcome you. If you're going there to shoot their cricket match, they'll most likely welcome you. All right. So, but I used to cover with a newspaper, so I've done a lot. I've done all sorts of things. This is a county cricket match at Durham. Um, so again, you can take cameras. Um, this was on a Friday, so there was hardly any, I can show you, there's hardly any spectators. All right. It's all, it, it's very well, it's sparsely popular. Weekend was probably different, but on the Friday I could go there and I could choose any seat that I wanted so I could move around the stadium quite happily um, and I was there I was no special access you know I contacted them beforehand to explain what I wanted but I had no different access to you as a spectator there so um, you know get the wide angle shots get the hard thing you will need a long lens though um, you're so far away from the action that club local club you'll be closer but uh, somewhere like the um, the Riverside Stadium in Durham, you are quite a long way away. So I was using 100-400 with a 1.4 times converter to fill the frame. So, you know, county cricket matches, you'll you'll be limited because you're so far away. Um, but you can get shots like that. That was the 100-400 with a 1.4 converter on it. Um, so, and trying to capture the action. The problem with cricket is, there's a lot of period where then there's no action going on and you get, oh, okay, and your camera goes down and then suddenly something happens. So you've got to be ready all the time. So it's really difficult um, sport to shoot because it's a long sport. It's not like rugby, which is 80 minutes and it's done, or a race or a motor race, which is six hours for me or 
hour and a half if it's Formula One or whatever, or 30 minutes if it's a club club event, these things go on for four or five days. So, you know, you've got to be pace yourself, but you've got to be ready. So it's a, dis- a different discipline. Um, but you can capture good action shots if you're on the ball. Again, be ready. I say if you haven't got a long lens, shoot from the short boundary. Which you're, if you know about cricket, you understand what I mean because you're closer to the action. But you can get a short telephoto like um, 55-200 or the new 75-300 zooms. We more than long, the 100-400, you'll fill the frame. Um, it's great. So the last sport I'm going to talk about is rugby. Now, I love rugby. I've, I'm a fan. Um, I go to rugby matches as spectators with my, without my camera. have done for many years. I used to play in my younger days. Um, and it's great. I love, I love rugby. So I know the sport really well. Now, I've shot from club level all the way up to international level at Murrayfield, which is, this is a shot at Murrayfield. Obviously, here I'm on a media pass. Um, but club level, you can shoot as a spectator. OK. Um, so... If you go to an international, you're not going to be able to take a camera in. It won't be allowed. Um, it's just Murrayfield, Twickenham, wherever, Millennium Stadium in Cardiff. You won't be allowed to take Even Premiership, you won't be allowed. And you're stuck in one seat anyway. Normal times, obviously at the moment there's no spectators, but in normal times, you'd have thousands of people around you. you people are going to be jumping up and down. You don't want to be pointing a camera seriously and you've only got one position anyway so you're up in those stands you don't want to be bothering if you go to a club break club meeting you're going to be on the touchline you can move around you can get shots and it's it's a much better environment for to learn how to shoot rugby um, as i said i'm lucky i get to go and sit behind the touchline at murrayfield with a camera and get pictures for different clients it's um it's a it's a really brilliant uh, thing but it's challenging because it's a very different sport um it's fast moving the ball can disappear into a mall into a ruck um it can it can then shoot out one way you're on a telephoto lens your perspective is on one player and suddenly the ball's over there um so you've got to be thinking fast on your feet i've actually got one eye in my viewfinder and one eye the other eye's open Checking the periphery, making sure that I can see where the ball's gone. Um, you can also see the reaction of the, of the players. You also get a lot of um, the ball will disappear, as I said, but also the player will disappear by other players coming between you and the and the, and the camera, uh, between you and the subject. So um, this is where the ignore obstacles AF custom function comes in really useful because if you've got a player, the player's running across the pitch and they've got other players in between you, you don't want the autofocus going to the player in front of you you want it to stay on the player with the ball so you need to sort of move around um keeping the autofocus on the player or manual focus just doesn't work in this situation because it's so fast moving i've done it with manual focus it's a pain um in my old days when i shot nikon um fm f3s f4 because the autofocus wasn't very good with an f4 um it you i shot manual and it's very difficult uh, I can follow focus. I don't know if I could still do it because I don't do it anymore, but you can. It is possible, but you autofocus systems are so good these days. So you need to set it up to work with the sport you're shooting. So um, if the ball pops out, you need to go focus straight on the on the on the camera and try and get the um, expressions. You can see this is again the game against Fiji. Um, they've just scored. Scotland have just scored another try. They scored quite a few this match. Um, but you can see the player behind. He's telling the player to try his, uh, the Fuji, Fiji player. Fuji. It's not Fuji. It's Fiji. Um, player to, to grab the... Uh, stop the ball going over. But he's too late already. But you've got that brilliant facial expression from the players on the ground the scottish players on the ground and the guy the the, the fiji player shouting the orders to try and stop them scoring a try um it's it's part of why i love rugby um so the next shot is tommy seymour now i actually mucked up on this one um i was shooting what i tend to do is shoot with a 200 mil um but if they come within the 22 meter line i take the 1.4 times converter off so I've got two, the 200 mil without the converter, so I've got a wider field of view because this is actually shot with the 1.4 converter in place. Um, so I'd actually they were on the 22, and it I say about fast moving. It suddenly the players, it, the ball went across, and Tommy ran the ran it ran in. I didn't have time to change the lens. Now this is where a zoom lens would have come in quite handy. 
but under the floodlights, a 5.6 lens is not that good. So this is with the 200 mil with the 1.4 converter. I managed to get it. I've got lots of him stood upright, which I, I've, I'm either missing his legs or the top of his head because it's the frame is so thin. But luckily he dived across the line. Um, so I got him horizontal. So it fit, it fit the frame quite nicely. So um, this one's quite grainy. Um, I think I was shooting at something like 8,000 a second, even with a 2.8, because the floodlighting at Murrayfield is not the best. Um, I talked to the guys from Reuters and from AP, the big agencies, and they say it's the worst stadium for lighting. Um, and it also the colour cast. So you've got to be really care careful with floodlighting because the colour cast. So I think I should, but I was really, it's really sharp. You know, there is a bit of grain in it, but it doesn't matter. It gives the it gives the atmosphere of that image. Um, so yeah, it's uh, I, I really enjoyed that shot. That was, and I'm pleased I got it. You know, I was so, again, it locked on quite quickly, autofocus and followed him across the line. I've actually got him sliding as well, but this is a shot where he's diving across the line. Um, but I also got three or four shots as he slid across the, across the, um, the grass and then celebrated. I've got that shot as well. So, um, and this is another, um, one that you're going towards the line again you you get the set plays you get the thing the drive but you can see the determination this is the what i love about rugby is the determination the, the sweat the toil you can see all this where well, i don't get this in motorsport because you don't see the athletes at work whereas in canoe slalom rugby eventing you see the athletes at work so i try to capture the the, the facial expressions um and it, it's something i i love that's why i love shooting team sports Got a couple more questions before we finish. Ian said, should I be using centre or multi-point focusing? Now, so when you say centre, I assume you mean the single single point. Um, I always shoot single point and move the point around the frame as I need it. Um, if you're in a fast moving environment, I use can use zone, which is a 3-3 setup, and you can move that around the frame. I never use the full frame multi-point focusing because it will focus on something that you're not at the most inopportune moment it will shoot it will move to a, a, an object that you don't want to another player moving across the frame and suddenly it'll shoot off the frame um and you'll you, and you go oh right so you want to control the camera to make sure it stays on that point normally the subject's in the middle of the frames anyway so you want to keep the frame in the middle but you might want to put it high or low depending what's happening on the pitch or whatever you're shooting so you frame it right so trying to keep it on his face the one thing that works really well on the T4 and the T3 is the um, eye focus. Um, I don't use it for action, but I do use it in the pit lane if I'm shooting drivers or that sort of thing, or I'm shooting portraits, it, but it will work. It will work if it, in fast moving environments. So if you've got a face you want to lock on, it will follow. Um, and it's on the T3 and T4, it is really good. Uh, T2 was a bit hit and miss. Um, I'm pretty sure the firmware has improved somewhat, but the T3, T4 is actually fantastic. Connor's asked, how would I approach selling my images at a local motocross, motocross track? Yeah, you need to contact the organizers. Don't just do it. If you start trying to flog images to the, um, uh, the competitors, someone will report you and the organizers. You may have to pay a commercial fee um, if you want to sell images, but normally at small meetings, you might be able to get away with, you know, giving the organizers some images that they can use for publicity purposes. Um, so approach them, talk to them, tell them what you want to do. It's not a big deal. You know, the, the worst they can say is no, you know, they might already have somebody at that event selling and you don't want to cut across those people. Um, so just approach them and talk to them and explain what you want to do and again you might be surprised by what you get. Tony says what would be the best lens for shooting indoor karting? Now as I said earlier about Murrayfield, uh, indoor karting you've got the problem with lighting, um, especially arc lighting you turn, I've done an, um, ice hockey in Edinburgh, uh, was another sport I've shot, now you get this really weird magenta and green, uh, magenta and green uh, cyan um, colour cast because of the arc lighting you've got to be really careful so you've got to set up your um, white balance to shoot now you can shoot raw then you can correct it later in in um, in post but if you're shooting jpeg you need to set the auto auto um, set the white balance up take it off auto and set it up so you can actually get the color colors that you want not what's the the lighting is giving you um, fast lens um, it's not going to be very bright 
Um, again, if you're panning, it's not so much of a problem. So if you're panning with the ice, as I showed you earlier, you can get use slower shutter speeds. But if you want to freeze the action, a head-on shot or something, you're going to have to have an F2, F1.4 lens um, to get that shutter speed up. Again, don't be afraid to push the ISO. You know, you saw that rugby shot earlier. It, you can push the ISO 6400 without much difficulty and you're better off in a, having a grainy shot than a blurred shot if you don't want a blurred shot. Um, so um, push the ISO if you want, but the best lens is the best you can afford. Um, look at the range, if you're shooting on Fujifilm, go for the 5140 and buy a converter for it. So you're shooting F4 or buy the 90mm F2. Um, forget the 100-400 for indoor, in, indoor work, really. It's a lovely lens for outdoor work, but 5.6 you are limited, unless you're going to willing to push the, the, push the um, ISO. With the carting, you should be fairly close anyway. Um, if you can afford it, 200mm F2. But you know, it is, you know, 5,000 pounds. So it's a long, a lot less, but it is the best lens that Fujifilm make, uh, especially for my work. Um, so then, anyway, that's me done. Um, I hope that's been of interest to you guys and girls. Um, if you've got any questions, I'm sure that Clifton Cameras will put, um, forward any questions on to me. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it informative. Check me out. Um, you can see my thing, McLean Photographic. I'm on Instagram, Facebook. Please, if you've got any questions, fire me an email. Um, you'll find my email on my website at mcleanphotographic.com. Um, and I'm happy to help anybody that wants to get make a start in motorsport so or any sport. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to the guys at Clifton Cameras again for the opportunity. And I hope you found that informative. Thank you very much.